in this school and especially in this PhD program, a wide discussion with the students and other scholars about this uh, kind of topics in the last years. Uh, we feel somehow to be ready to discuss with others about this. Uh, uh, me and Giovanni published a book uh, two years ago so far and uh, there is a, a journal with uh, Arde Architectural uh, Design Theory, it's a sort of a, uh, name of brand we started with this. And uh, so it, we, we are finished to, to arrange the fourth uh, issue of this journal too, which is going out in a few weeks, I think. And so uh, it, uh, through the journal, through our publication, through these invitations, through the visiting professor, for instance, last year there, were, there was uh, Albena Ianeva in, uh, ho hosted in our course too, and through a lot of other initiatives who will be uh, re reminded to this uh, seminar, I think. Uh, we're trying to encourage a new discussion of, about the project on a theoretical basis. Of course, I expect that in this case, this is the, the opening seminar of the, of the course, will last uh, until uh, June, we'll have maybe five uh, meetings and the last one will be mostly led by the PhD students coming also from, from other schools. And we hope to have some uh, a sort of community discussing about the architectural project, mostly in theoretical terms, even if I would like to understand what does it mean to be theoretical on the project. Uh, so this is uh, an, an, op an opening seminar and an open seminar too because we really do, do not know what will happen because uh, most uh, of, of our hosts in this case are not uh, already our um, partners in research. So it's a sort of a opening dialogue also in, in the relationship among us. And so I hope it will be uh, interesting Interesting, and I, I also uh, have the suspect that we'll have uh, uh, very deeply different positions of, of the project, of the architectural project. Since uh, sure. if, I, if I think about, uh, if I re recall what I read about our hosts, I, I think we will have some surprises because the approaches seem to be totally different. And it, it is maybe the main. Uh, mm, the main interest for me in this seminar is to understand how how this dialogue will work. So this is why the table is a ring. It's a ring. Square yeah. is a ring. Yeah, of course. So I will let, we, uh, let the floor to our uh, PhD students. Eduardo and Caterina uh, have taken care of this first meeting uh, with a very, very strong effecti effectiveness, I think. So. They, they can uh, introduce us uh, to hosts and maybe give us the, the more specific topic. Thank, uh, yeah. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as the Professor Armando said, it is the first appointment of a doctoral course. Uh, anyway, it is a seminar, let's say it's a little bit strange, in the sense that it is a kind of bridge between a two-day seminar that we had a month ago with Professor uh, Petar Bojanic, uh, and the actual, actual one with the coming events. Um, and you may have read from the email that I sent you, uh, we propose to have uh, the lectures in the morning, uh, and then in the afternoon we can try to link our PhD researches and thesis with the, the discussion that, that will emerge from the, the lecture themselves. Um, Petar Bojanic will be, let's say, a kind of chair of this meeting, is professor at the University of Belgrade, where he is also a director of the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory, and he is also one of the directors of the Center for Advanced Studies in uh, Rijeka, and actually is working on the social ontology and obviously also on the design concept and project. Uh, Znezana Vesnic uh, works uh, at the University of uh, Belgrade. She did a PhD research on the role and the status of the of Concept, uh, from which a book will be published uh, soon in English. Uh, and she will deliver a lecture which uh, focus will be the object and, uh, and the concept. 
we also have uh, two French guests who we don't need. It's the first time we meet you, so I will ask you maybe before the presentation to introduce to us your specific work on this topic of uh, uh, project and critic. Uh, our guests are uh, Pierre Kay. Uh, welcome to Turin. And, uh, Thank you very much. He works in a center of research in CNRS, which is an analysis of our GNR. And uh, uh, the other guest is Karim Bakus, uh, who also worked on project and critique in the, um, in the MCAU. I don't know the pronunciation in Italy because they are all acronyms. So uh, this is another institution uh, research in France, and maybe you can explain us what you do in your center in your specific research to make us know better, because also the, the meetings you had before, because uh, it's interesting for us to understand the relationship and the previous uh, occasions you had to discuss about these subjects. Well, this is the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should I go? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, uh, okay, I. Uh, th this is one that will not be uh, moderating uh, work, but at, at the beginning, some small, we can say, introductory uh, word. I, I, I named this uh, intervention Is the project or object nella testa dell'architetto? Or is there anything? Nella testa dell'architetto, uh, o soggetto o autore. Uh, before I elaborate uh, on my title, let me thank uh, Giovanni Bubiano and Alessandro Armando for their kind hospitality, as well as all the doctoral candidates who I know quite well by now and with whom I found it a real pleasure to work. It is indeed they who are true engine of Giovanni's and Alessandro's engagement. The great book, uh, Teoria del Progetto Architettonico, that lies at the foundation of this seminar, which we should celebrate always anew, as well as a project of a small book about the project that we have yet to realize, are important elements in the context surrounding our meeting today. Let me also thank Pierre Kai and Karim Basbus who agreed to come for a joint workshop. I hope that we will all meet again in Belgrade, for which I would like to immediately propose the date of April 12th, when Jörg Gleiter will be visiting in Belgrade, but also in Bieka, Dubrovnik, Paris, Berlin, etc. And I'm particularly glad to have Snežana Vesnić with us here. Her doctoral thesis, which is to be published in English soon, is on the concept and was written at the same time as Giovanni and Alessandro were working on their book. It was Snežana who unearthed Pierre's and Karim's text at the RABA library and drew my attention to them. Karim's idea of the project on research, the project as an investigation, fits in well with the title of our seminar, Innovazione del Progetto, or what Torbiano and Armando call in Sapere Progettuale come Disciplina. It's Sapere Progettuale come Disciplina. Disciplina e Sapere, no? Sapere, what discipline, discipline is to learn together. Uh, il Sapere Progettuale come Disciplina. Uh, this is quotation from uh, 43 from, from their book. It seems to me that this group is, I think this is group, let's see, is together capable to justify certain hypotheses or ideas found in our texts. In any case, we will shortly find out whether this group has a future. Which is why I would like to give a few reasons that might justify meeting such as this in the future. And of course, I would also like to warn of some difficulties. Let us ignore for a moment that first and most obvious difficulty that I'm not an architect. Uh, my mentor uh, was also fond of repeating this, uh, that's okay, 
and they are dilettantes completely, dilettante, huh? in a room of mostly architects, designers, historians of architecture, experts on aesthetics. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, uh, Karim uh, uh, told me that his supervisor was not Yves Erson, who was here in Torino several months ago. He was a guest of Maurizio, but his, I forget the name, Karim. Uh, okay. Uh, the greatest difficulty is the confusion and uh, chaos that pervades so-called architectural terminology. I think, uh, well, uh, when I heard uh, uh, Alessandro's uh, uh, intervention uh, just several minutes before, we are here, I think, to, uh, to try to, to build uh, architectural terminology, and I'm sure that in 50 years it will not be dilemma here or in any I don't know, any faculties in Europe or in the United States, uh, what is the project, what is the concept, what is the design. Uh, now we have a mess, but uh, well, this is a small step to, to change something. Followed by the possibility or uncertainty that in the future there will even be anything that could be called <coughs> architectural terminology, which is to say it is uncertain that we are com compiled, complying with anything of the sort with these, with these doctoral candidates. Along with this, the language we use, the language in which I'm now reading, this is also problematic because, okay, there is no one in this room whose native, maybe, maybe yes, but uh, whose native language is English. England is not in Europe. We are using this, this, well, I hope, I hope, maybe, maybe not, maybe. Uh, this is not certain also. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we have a problem uh, because we are, uh, we are talking in between. We urgently need, okay, my, my uh, idea is contrary, need someone who speaks uh, this language well because uh, uh, we, are, we are in process of improvisation, we are not uh, good, we are, how to say, we have, we have a problem uh, with language. Uh, several times uh, Karim told me, okay, is it possible to talk in French, it's better in French. Snežana, oh, I will, I will talk differently in, in uh, Serbian, Croatian, etc., etc. Okay, it's a problem. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, there is a problem also with architects and designers, especially them, having to speak or write at, at all, uh, regardless of language. Uh, uh, well, a month ago, for example, in Berlin, Eisenman, who in one way or another, a close presence to all of us, uttered the following sentence that I am quoting now, Eisenman, I am not able to write what I think. I think that all of you, in one way or another, uh, can sign this sentence. Uh, for, for you, architects generally is a problem to write. Uh, it's not a problem to think, but I hope. Uh, but when, anyway. And then, uh, Eisenman again, I can teach concept, but not project. I can teach concept but not project, which is something he cannot explain because, as he puts it, I quote again Eisenman, project is an elusive term in English. This is this is this is problem. We are I am using something now, uh, uh, I'm using several words now which are not uh, which are not good. Uh, I remember uh, I think it was uh, one year ago. You, in your book, this Teoria del Progetto, uh, your, your tra translation of Progetto was designed at the beginning. Now I, I'm, I think that you are, you are, you change your mind. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, over two years ago, in, in one interview entitled On the End of Authority, uh, Eisenman, uh, which is which has still to be published, he says, Eisman again, that's how you teach project, by reading. Okay, uh, now he said, uh, I can teach concept but not project. And then, uh, before, uh, two years ago, also interview, we can say that this is, this is oral, conversa verbal conversation, he said, uh, I can teach project but by reading and thinking in the design studio. You can't just have a history, history theory sequence. That means it's impossible to teach project, to understand what is project here. 
forget this, this is nothing. In your studio, you can teach the others what is the project. Well, this is, this is uh, problematic for, for us, how to theorize something which is... Okay, uh, here are three, reason, three reasons why we should indeed continue working together. The first is the defense of collective work, which necessarily implies the impossibility of existence of the project or design without group work and action. I would here like to insist that the concept is essentially collective, cooperative entity. Concept also, okay, that could be also stupid. Because in Corbusier, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, in Cor Corbusier's language would be inexact when he writes in his famous letter from 22 November uh, 1908, Mon concept s'établit and mon concept de l'art. Uh, uh, although there might be some concept that is only mine, it's, I think, it's thematization. If you, if you, if you thematize concept, then you will see that this thematization and manifestation unfolds with others and before others. It is similar with the idea of the project produced by, for example, I found this in a Kojev uh, book, uh, produced by a uh, chief of the group or an idea that promotes uh, one as the group chief. Uh, I, will, I will quote after this. Uh, the second reason refers to the great difficulties in translating various terms from one language to another. These difficulties are impossible to overcome without simultaneous use of multiple languages and thematizations of differences. Uh, because project uh, is not the same as a projet uh, or a progetto, etc., etc., and we have a, uh, we must, uh, how to say, uh, differentiate again and uh, make distinctions again and uh, try to, how to say, to harmonize uh, something because it's not normal that, that uh, when Chumi says, for example, concept that is not the same as. Corbusier here or Karim, for example. That's that's the that's the, the that's the problem. Uh, because anyway, uh, uh, you have also obscure and violent, violent symmetries. I, I'm not here to to uh, how to say to uh, to uh, make some kind of uh, forced symmetry or forced uh, well. But uh, we have something, for example, Antoine Picot, who was in in a, in, in a jury the thesis or president of jury uh, the Karim uh, during the Karim defense, uh, he has a one one text uh, with the title "The Project, uh, comma and the absent concept." The project and absent concept. Uh, well, it's uh, that means the project is. Uh, presence of the concept, okay? Well, or I, I, I quote here uh, uh, Chumi uh, in, in red uh, book uh, 495, uh, uh, quotation, for example, like this. I quote Chumi, there is no architectural project without topographical, programmatic, budgetary, or political constraints. However, Designing the Acropolis Museum involved perhaps the most unusual set of constraints imaginable. This is okay, but now constraints were the context where the context of the project constraints. And then could this again could these constraints be turned into a concept? Well, that means uh, that means concept is something before project and for many of us, this is clear, but let's, in your book, there is no concept, or there is no thematization of concept. Let's, let's think about this again. And the final reason, particularly why we have to work together, the final reason, particularly important for me, since I have spent the last few years dealing with theory and philosophy of the institution, as is what Eisenman, along with Derrida, to be sure, calls the institutional aspect of architecture. He speaks about 
this when writing about the critical dimension of architecture and about architectural and social life. Okay, a few months ago, when we held a joint seminar in Torino on the project, we attempted to provide a few of its elementary characteristics. One of them was that the project is necessarily an object. Uh, that was the, the, the title of the seminar or workshop uh, with Eisenman in Berlin. At the same time, a few of us were discussing the object in Belgrade, and Snezhana will today speak about the object in a similar context. And then in Berlin, as I said, uh, for all these reasons, the word object appears in my title along with the word subject and project. Okay, you, you remember what said Bachelard 100 years ago that this is the time, uh, I quote him, this is, the, this is not the time in science for the subject or object, this is the time for project. The relation between these words are not my focus, at least not today. Rather, I would like to situate the object as something that in person X, X had. Uh, what, does, what is the object in the head of one person? Or uh, ought to proceed with the project concept design. What is the relation between object and on one side and on the other side project concept design? More precisely, whether something that is testa, which it would seem is already material, because testa is an object, or brain is object, or shall we say objective, can truly be the space in testa for the object as a project concept design. How to make position for the project concept design uh, uh, from the perspective of test. What, okay, the problem is in the title is as, because I said here, is the project, no, 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 I said here uh, as, uh, uh, object as project, or project as object concept as object, etc. My subtitle contains a few variations on words I have drawn from Turbiano and Armando's book. Uh, okay, I, I found, because I have an electronic version of the book, I put the test, and la testa dell'architetto, soggetto autore, uh, uh, what is la prima che nella testa dell'architetto, uh, uh, 15 pagina, il progetto ridotto a intenzione, uh, 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 page 33, also uh, he said uh, that that is the principal critique of the intentionality. He said, il progetto sembra essere rimasto richiuso nella testa di chi lo con concepisce. concepisce. Il maestro, il maestro che ritiene i segreti della forma o l'esperto che possiede la tecnica. Intrapolato nella impenetrabile irreduttibilità del soggetto, il progetto non è che un'intenzione, priva di traccia. Ok, this is uh, this is uh, okay, this is everything that uh, Giovanni and Alessandro uh, done is against this. Uh, that means the intestine non c'è niente. Ok, uh, 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 their intention is to show that it is less important for architectural epistemology of architecture whether something, if anything at all, is inside someone's head. That is to say, their intention, Armando e Giovanni, is not in their heads and intention as such is negligible in relation to facts, documents or social objects which are real, objective and actually circulate among heads. That means what is objective? Where is the object? Object is between, between our heads, between, uh, not in the heads. The fact that there are two heads, okay, yeah. two heads, if you put the plural uh, you, it will be complicated, much more complicated than in that case because I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Armando and jo Giovanni are not against this idea that exists collective intentional, which is important for, for everything. If we say that individual intentionality is not important for project, 
is not important for objects, for facts. If you put the testa in, in plural, in that case we will have a relations between, and in that case probably, uh, probably uh, with collective intentionality, because without collective intentionality there is no project, there is no document, and you have to solve this problem and if you want to defend collective intentionality in front of individual. But okay, this is, this is one uh, uh, condition. The condition for something to be a fact or object is indeed a head in the plural, that is multiple heads or intentions reduced to collective intention that constructs reality. This construction of reality or joint produ production of facts unfolds in processes or steps or temporal intervals which could then be named using words such, a, such as concept, project and design. In any case, these words or acts or protocols should not even exist in the head as object. Okay, this is one of them. There is, no, there is nothing in the head as such, as a concept, project or design. How is this even possible? Uh, okay, I said here, uh, never mind what is epistemology architecture. This is a different problem. It's, it's, it's much more interesting. Interesting is different position. Different position is, is uh, formulate very easy in a letter to Alessandro on September last year. Peter Eisenman writes, I quote Eisenman. Armando was very gentle to, to show, show to all of us this letter. I quote Eisenman, I think my idea is Bottega is different. I think my idea of Bottega is different. For me, Bottega is in my head. Uh, okay, uh, in, in this book there is many times, uh, there are many times uh, uh, thematized the word Bottega, but Bottega, what is the Bottega? Bottega is the, the atelier, the studio, the laboratory or boutique. Since etymologically, Bottega is a place, un luogo, means for storing sundry objects. And that means in Bottega you have an object. And in Bottega, uh, is, if Bottega is in, in head, in that case, is Bottega is in head, in that case, in a, in there are many objects in the architect's head. What are these objects or objects in the head? The title I gave to the Sebo Creation Translation of the Eisenman Collection of Text was The Ideal Object of Architecture. And uh, Derrida uh, uh, imagined his unwritten doctoral thesis with the same title, The Ideality of Literary Object, Idealité de l'objet littéraire. And in Eisenman's text, misreading Eisenman, you can you can find the phrase the object is it, the object as ideal essence. The object as ideal essence. A few years ago in Belgrade, he differentiates Eisenman between object as a mental construct mm -hmm. from the actual object. That means exists something, but the object as a mental construct. In that case, in Bottega, there is some kind of mental constructs, mental uh, object as a mental construct. This, you know, this is the West philosophy, West or way of thinking to, to say number to quoi, to say stupidity. Object is something material. This is object. But, well, object could be ideal, could be mental. This is a little bit crazy. But anyway, we have in tradition we have this from Alberti, we have this from, I don't know, from Pilaret, Pilaret. We have this idea that there exists something mental which is object. And this is in front of, this is ideal object. Absolute model of the object in general. This is, this is uh, uh, Derrida in Pousse, l'objet ideal et le modèle absolu de l'objet en général. Here, this uh, 
the ideal object is the absolute model of the object in general. And this implies that this ideal is actually regulative and opposed to object not purely intentional or object that are intentional. Cum fundamento in re, okay, I put here uh, in garden, uh, who differentiate ordinary physical objects and mental objects, etc. Et my problem or my uh, uh, proposition is how to uh, how to this two different different position how to harmonize them and how to try to to uh, how to say to to understand the difference the, the distinction uh, and what uh, in that case what what be the connection of ideality ideal object with the project concept in design. We could also ask, what should the head do and what emerges from the head or how distribution of various objects in conducted from the botega? In a word, what is a project and how do we project that is designed? Levinas' book on intu intuition in Husserl contains the phrase uh, une structure ideale de l'objet, structure, ideal structure of the object, and it displays rather well the nature of the ideal. That means the head, Eisenman's head and the other, does not contain objects, this would be nonsense, nor even the ideal or ideas, this is the point, there, in the head there is no objects, in the head there is no ideas, because this is trivial, there are many ideas, it's nothing. Rather, in the head, it con head contains the ideal of the object of such. Ideal of the object of such. That means you have a, some kind of theater between ideality in the head and the object. Object and ideality. The idea of something that has physical presence is precisely the conceptual or concept. The idea of something that has physical presence is precisely the conceptual or the concept. That means, in his famous text on conceptual architecture, Eisenman finds that the idea within the thing itself to be synonymous with the conceptual structure of the thing itself. And finally, that the physical reality itself does have a conceptual aspect. Physical reality itself have a conceptual aspect. Uh, okay. Uh, again, and that, that will be that will be conclusion. What is the novelty here? Uh, projecting or to project. The project is to throw something forward in front of oneself. To Jetter, jetare, jetare, jetare. Projecting is not project, projecting or designing an object. You, you, you not. Primo, jetto, jetto, oggetto, jetto, oggetto. Because this is how it is possible. Jetto, oggetto, jetto, concept, jetto, ideality. Jet of something, something with idea. Uh, uh, the object is rather discovered, discovered, revealed, selected, exposed, presented before by way of concept. At the beginning, at the, at the, at the beginning, you have an object. You have a sun. You have a, a stone. You have a tables. You have a. Then you have a representation in our mind. Because exists something, you know, in the West exists mind, exists esprit, exists head, exists brain. This is the words, but anyway, exists something. You have a representation of this. That could be notions. Begriffe, Christian Wolf. Then you have a combination of this representation. That could be conceptual structure. Could be some kind of ideality. There is no ideality without 
the, 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 without sun, without the notions, without the table, without this. That means I, I'm, I tried to justify realism, your realism. Huh? That means at the beginning we have real physical objects. Then we have representation of them. Then we have drama, theater. Between the objects and representations, and this drama uh, produced concepts. Concepts, this is very possible to say like this because we have this in Alberti. Uh, okay, I have here the text of Pierre. Uh, Pierre Kai, uh, who quotes Alberti, who said here, design a right to design. Okay, I have this in English. Uh, this is this, uh, this is stupid. In French, is le projet, le, pro, le, le projet né de la capacité que possède l'homme, etc. Ici, in English translation, this is your translation. You translated, not you, Pierre, somebody translated design. It's, 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 why design, not projet? I think it's better project here. Anyway, here is mentioned that design or pro project arises from man's capacity to conceive in advance. Capacity to conceive in advance. This is Albert. That means in a head, in a mind, in l'esprit, you have something prescribere in, in animo et mente. Prescribere in animo et mente. That means in objectual Objectual, uh, how to say, objectual entity, which is head, which is mind, which is uh, this is also real. You have drama, you have then concepts, and after that you you jetare, jetto di concept, and this is project. A dopo design or simultaneously design. Because design is operation to, to uh, give a first sketch of this drama between objective and concept. Okay, I tried with this because I am not one of you. I am not in your family. I am dilettante. <laughs> I tried to des de describe something and to describe these two or several positions and to put several places here with the, at the end of this text, I mentioned several filarete, I mentioned Alberti, I mentioned uh, uh, Balthasar Drassian, uh, Christian Wolf, Schopenhauer, Husserl, etc., etc., Virilio. Uh, uh, that exists in the West tradition, exists something in the head, well, I imagine that there exists some something, uh, how to say, some kind of drama between subjective and objective, and then project is born, and then you. That means, in that case, I tried to make some kind of preambula of this. Preambula, because it's not a problem this. Problem is, for you, my answer, my question for you is, is it possible to solve uh, collective intentionality and forget intentionality? Because, you know, it's necessary to read Husserl, not Maurizio. It's necessary to read Husserl, to read huge tradition of Brentano, etc., etc., to understand intentio and try to uh, transform, transform it in collective intention. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful intervention, which includes uh, us the topic. If there are any questions or commentaries, our idea was to go on not. not uh, addressing now the main topics, but to go on, on the presentations. But if there are some more specific questions, we can uh, uh, better will, uh, answer. Or we go on with uh, the presentation, which will have a yes, I'm an architect. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for your invitation to speak today and thank you for making these important architectural terms in the title of the seminar card. It's my great pleasure to be here, not only because the focus of my practical and theoretical work, architectural works of concepts, uh, but also because I myself work with students, researching, creating, designing new concepts through their projects and our projects. Despite my intention to explain what is an architectural concept, I will take this opportunity to speak more about the objects, more specifically, objects of architecture. I will attempt, from the position of architect practitioner, to explain the process of creation, the material, the real object. My aim thus is to simultaneously show the relation among the concept or project and design by projecting the concept of object and attempt to define what is an architectural concept. In this sense, this small project can be interpreted as one possible reconstruction of the process of projecting and the presentation of architectural design methodology. Uh, it is important, next slide please. This is important at the very beginning to determine the context and my approach to architecture as a discipline of the creation of the new, both and equally for theory and the practice. Next. First, for me, the primary dialectic of architecture takes place between the subject and the object of architecture. It is intentional towards the object and the imperative of fundamental intentionality of architecture and the architect is a physical object in time and space. Uh, sorry. Uh, it is important at the very beginning to determine the context and my approach to architecture as a discipline of creation of the new, both and equally through theory and the practice. First, for me, the primary dialect of architecture takes place between the subject and the object of architecture. It is intentional towards the object and the imperative of fundamental intentionality of architecture and the architect is a physical object in time and space. This means for the architecture to be architecture by definition, it assumes the presence of object. Second, my thesis is that architecture, much like philosophy, is the production of concepts as a theory of easier definition. Indeed, taking a step further, architecture is both production of concepts and creation with concepts. Uh, I didn't have in mind to read uh, very rich footnotes in this text, but I must uh, just read a few sentences of first footnote because of Peter's thought, uh, I must that it is uh, very important. Intentionality is the connection between consciousness and its object, that is between the subject and its object. It is above all a category to, uh, that comes to us from phenomenology. Intentionality, directness, means that consciousness is always consciousness of something. Thus, it is always outside itself. It follows that it is a category of subjective paradigm in philosophy, in other words, philosophy of mind. Following Ferraris, Armando and Turbiano take issue with this position. Instead of intentionality, they advocate a category of documentality. Instead of intentional act, written on. However, since it is impossible to suppress the object-subject relation in architecture as well as have the object of architecture project or concept without a subject, there will always be this relation. <coughs> since intentionality in architecture refer refers to and, fo and focuses on the real architecture object, it must be written down, documented, or must have self-capacity to present that is document itself. It is a characteristic of architectural concept. When it is named, that is presented, the intentional act simultaneously becomes a written act. Uh, 
the move I would like to make here today is to define uh, uh, the architecture concept as object, that is the first architecture object which includes the ideality projected <coughs> through the architecture project into the real object of architecture, which is the second architecture object. Let me begin with the object. The dictionary definition is the extreme other scope of given operation. Put as broadly as possible, the object will be goal or limit of any kind of activity. Apart from that, the object points to the relation of ability of subject towards the result of these abilities, toward that in which they end. According to phenomenology as the relevant philosophical project, an object could be anything held as content to judgment, that is, which could be placed under judgment. This object would be intentional content, the content of intentional act. In other words, when I project something, I must call what I am projecting. When I build something, I must call what I'm building. When I'm thinking or inventing something, I'm holding that which I'm thinking. In general, let me take the risk of the classification. I think that this classification is Ferrari's classification. Object can be divided into three kinds, real or physical, ideal and social. The real object is the only one that extends its space in time. Simply put, it is a physical thing. The ideal object, in contrast to real ones, exists or is created as such independently of space and time, such as mathematical theory. And social objects, although they have duration, they extend in time, they have only minimal spatial extension. Were it to determine the object as which they stand, which it is set upright, which holds and perseveres before the gaze and thought, then the object of architecture can be grasped by the subject, or it can appear in two ways of modalities. There are estima, the object of aesthetics, and noima, the object of logic, as transcendental object. To borrow vocabulary, vocabulary from structuralism, the latter in general corresponds to what we term as signified. Estima would generally fall within the field of the called signifier, or the image of concept. For Peter Eisenman, aesthetic always has advantage in the dichotomy because the idea of presence and the representation of presence represses all other interpretation, represses textuality. However, since the architectural object, which although it has an immediate aesthetic and function represented in its presence, never exists as a thing itself, and never entirely overlaps with substance, it will forever point to its own absence. In other words, in addition to the fullness and presence that exist in themselves, the object always contains the other, its own absence. The question then is how these two existences make up a single totality or one whole, which we name the architectural object. Clearly, between two different kinds of modalities of the object, there will always be specific asymmetry. As a schema, the object appears as a figure of image, as body, or sensory configuration of the referent, thought, given over representation, that is projection. While the object is noima, corresponds to the term or word. Eisenhower would say text, which constitutes it in its transcendental objectivity. This asymmetry of appearance means that the possibility of ultimate interpretation and final explanation of the architectural object disappears in its realization. If the interpretation of the object is never complete, this means that there is a dimension of architectural work that is not discursively expressible and didactically transmittable for one generation to the next. On the other hand, if the essence of the architectural object is manifested above all in its material appearance, that the commercialability of the sensor experience necessarily surpasses any attempt of reconstruction of the project genesis. Will there then forever be part of architecture that cannot be put in the words, just as there will always be some words that cannot be rendered material in architectural form? The question is indeed, what is the ideal object of architecture? Or what is the ideal of architecture object? 
is this, the secret place, unfamiliar place, the locus of secretness that Nouvelle, Jean Nouvel, architect, defines as which forever eludes, or better, to the extent ineffable or invincible part of the architecture object. Hypothetically, if we were to dematerialize the architecture object, liberate of its materiality, would be rich to approach this ideality. Perhaps the lack of one is simultaneously the success of the other, or else we are dealing with the creation of difference between presence and absence they then named the architectural object. This only seemingly complicated answer indicates that the architectural object will always be between what we name aesthetic and what we name philosophy of the architectural object, how an architectural object is seen and how it is distorted or thematized. Conceptus literally means fetus and the entity conceived in woman's belly, the result of inferior gestation. In late Roman times, it begins to be used metaphorically among grammarians to indicate intellectual representation of what takes place in the mind. The term then makes into the philosophical vocabulary and following uh, its etymology, con capere, or to, uh, to take together, indicate, indicates the unification of plurality in common apprehension. It thus acquires to the status of the term that epistemologically refers not only to the product or process of mind engendrement, but to also the collection of multitude of elements in single perception. Allow me briefly separate a few interpretation of the concept that helped me to determine the architecture concept as an object to do all nature. In the European written tradition, the concept was determined in various ways. I will group into one set the definitions and consideration of three important authors, Gian Battista Vico, Francesco Suarez, and Camillo Pellegrino. <coughs> Vico speaks explicitly about the concept in a lesser known work, using the image of salt as a metaphor to refer to a substance whose nature is to directly arouse our sensuality, precisely through its ingenuity. Interestingly, he emphasizes the aesthetic aspects of logical categories by speak, speaking of beauty and grace of judgment. Aside from this unusual combination, throughout his focus, Miko uses the term concept, even when dealing with purely philosophical problems in the sense of mental concept. In metaphysical disputation, Suarez differentiates between two types of, of concept, a formal and an objective concept. The first is intellectual act that grasps a thing. It is the act of grasping itself, which Suarez also called verbo. On the other hand, the objective is the thing, or its essence immediately understood or represented with the form of concept. It is the thing itself. Suarez adds that the latter includes fictitious object, transferring into different vocabulary, the form of concept correspond to the noesis or the objective of noema or the signified. And the third author, Pellegrino, also wrote in a tract in dialogue form. Several characters in the book, among whom philosopher, poet, and rhetorician, talks about what is a concept and what is its place and the role in creation of work. In general, the concept is described as an image of object, the section of interest to us is where the definition of concept and its classification are given. At one point, the philosopher distinguishes between the universal and poetic concept. The universal con uh, concept is further divided into formal and the objective concept. The first is defined as in an intellectual act, and the second refers to an intellectual object that is to be grasped by the act, the goal towards which the it aims at which is directed. On the other hand, the poetic concept is an object of thought that occurs a fantasy that is to say the image of real thing or thing that looks real. Vico and Suarez consideration mostly refer to nature of concept, while Pellegrino systematization also explicitly talks about the function of the concept. In the 20th century, Abagnano distinguished between the nature of the uh, concept and its function. The function of the concept can be revealed 
or express the essence of the team. While it is, uh, in operative sense, we should know the function and the description and redu uh, reduction that is to describe the object with the aim to ensure their uh, future recognition. In addition, Abagnano also scribes in the role of prediction where it serves as an anticipatory or projective means of procedure in resolving the problem. Similarly, Billy is bound the concept to the problem since without the problem, the concept would be meaningless. We should note that the concept in architecture doesn't solve a problem. Rather, above all, it defines the value of problem, formulates it, again generates the creative potential and the temporal context, context in which the problem can be solved, taught, or complicated. The function of intentionality and creative potency, potency of architectural concept as well as capacity for explanation with the imperative of present simultaneously absence define its nature between noima and estima. The definition of the objects that indicate the relation of capacity of the subject to achieve the outcome of this activity and the understanding of the object as intention of content, the content of potential act, allow us to interpret the architectural concept as object. The architectural concept is a philosophical aesthetic object, like Pellegrino's universal and poetic concept connecting in the one whole with the capacity to project philosophy and aesthetic onto the architecture, a real object. Projecting onto the real object, the concept directs the constitution and meaning of the object of architecture. Is in this action, the concept is not the ideal object of architecture but it takes hold, maintains, and projects the idea of ideal with the capacity and intention to direct and develop the project in order for the physical object to approach the ideality. By revealing or seeking ideality, the concept is continuously self-projecting, ensuring its eternity in search of the ideal. This means that the function of the architectural concept is to implement the ideal into the physical object as such, projecting the idea of ideal. The real architecture object is one of the projection of the concept, one outcome of the intention of realization of the idea in the real. The capacity of the concept lies in the contingencies for constructing ideal value in the real architectural context. When estima and noima of the concept overlap or became realized in a single projection, when they are achieved in one, when, they, when what we've seen and thought is identical, that is reality. Ungers, for example, defined reality as what we are able to conceptualize or what we are represented such. Ungers uses the word realität in the sense Hegel designates for the word, replicate binding the object to it. I will make a distinction between the real and the reality. What is the reality and with it like, and does Hegel. The former is close to existence, the object like raw death, where the latter is understood as actual, effective reality. Hegel further distinguishes between the virtue. The first designates the actual, while the second, what is active, and can we take off on effectiveness that is can act and form which verb are deduced action and reaction. I emphasize this subtle and meticulous distinction in layering of language in order to explain architecture not only as production but continuous but as continuous projection, action and reflection uh, of this act. In the distinction between these modalities of existence, we can explain precisely the purpose and meaning of architectural concept. As cause and reflection, it means the existence of idea that conceptual action surpasses an passive effect, making the very process of creation, as well as subsequent projection, the essence of any architectural process. What is being created? acted upon what is made or produced on the other hand and simultaneously that act is influences something as projection, action and reflection of the same act 
are two inseparable parts of the process of single art or creation. The concept then produces reality. Its acting actions, its causality gives shapes and creates a morphos of objectivity. Reality is what is created from the concept, otherwise it is mere fact, a real that is not but reprogramming the spatial temporal facts. Peter Eisenman will explain this throughout the relation of project and design. There are many num uh, any there are any numbers of ways to explain the connection between architectural design and architectural project. The word design, along with all its etymological variation, has a rich history, but in architectural practice, here I'm including both design and project. It is necessary to make a distinction between design as process and design as finished project, product. I would like to explain how design as process is used as an instrument of concept for the production of the architectural object using the least relation, the actual virtual corresponding to architectural procedures. Following the rules, architectural design can be explained as a complex process of converting the possible, ideally to the real, using those moments for actualizing a state of entity or entities in order to achieve dynamic field of continuous reduction of the virtual to realize the actual. In 20th century lecture in Milan, Eisenman mentioned the virtual hermeneutic object of the modern, the object within the object to be part of cognitive process. But what is important is that the virtual has the capacity to provoke actualization, whether text or image, even if it never quite coincides or can be completely uh, identified with the actualization of the real. In virtual processes are used as part of cognitive ones. They then can be served as method methodological models in the process of the design and the actual. The creation of architectural object is not linear process from the virtual and actual, nor a simple, pro uh, simple projection of the concept throughout the architectural design of architectural project. The problem occurs because the relation of the subject and the object is established in the course of process, primarily because any form of creation simultaneously carries the problem of its projection. In both Eisenman and Deleuze, we find the virtual proceeding and talking form of any actualization. Eisenman distinguished between three phase states of uh, virtual. The first refers to relation that are implied by a condition of presence but that exists beyond the literal of the ideal. Further, it is a hypothetical version of something, and the reality of architectural work exists between the drawings and the buildings themselves as the virtual. In the architecture, project design ser serves to produce the virtual. Thus, the importance of design as process, method, and generation of the virtual goes and surpassing the traditional role or purely technical production of the project or even its final product. Design becomes the conceptual method tool for reconstructing and deconstructing the future reality, a means to create virtual reality that would allow for critical examination of the project of the future object of architecture. The architectural privilege of conceptualization to think abstractly and produce virtually gives us the freedom and ability in the process of projecting. The architecture concept spars the woman who thought and processing the successive projections aiming to appear in the project projecting as a deal. Hence, we can always refer to Deleuze's morality to never seize the concept as simple. Clearly, the concept has open relationship with the architecture project. In a kind of parallelism and self-projection, and self-establishment, the architectural concept liberates new complex relations and conceptions on certain functions and strategies inventing new realities. Chumi goes a step further, posing the question of when and whether architecture can be exhausting in the drawing, which deals only with the idea and concept. For Eisenman, the real architecture only exists in the drawings. The real buildings exist outside the drawings. Similarly, for Chumi concept, not the form, is what distinguishes architecture from mere building. 
is architecture that already is drawing or is the concept notation in the project, or it is the project as projection of concept. Derrida opened the question of always subsequent projection, the question of what it is, the projects in front, or in advance in the project, projection, program prescription, promise proposition, of everything that belongs in architecture process to the moment of throwing or being thrown. The architecture project is guided and dependent on architectural concept. Eisenman equates the basic question of project with ethics on intention in architecture, while the institutional or disciplinary power of the project is to influence, to determine, in direct the world. In Eisenman's formation of project, the concept is the core, while the conceptualization of the idea opens the possibility of having project. This is to say, it allows for the creation of relation within the project, which then defines the overall specific context in which ideas will materialize. Eisman is the idea or meta project. Six project that define the world is, in a sense, analogous to the Luis Gattari plan of immanence that creates the image of thought. Um, it is, in a full sense, social object. Liberating our spell of spatial dimensions <coughs> becomes a temporal object that surpasses its special and pragmatic protocol contextualized in a modern historical context, context. So the most important question of architecture as well philosophy resides in the similar point where concept and creation are related to each other. Deleuze and Gattari grounded creation of self-establishment as what makes as concept powerful and gives power to all ensuring philosophy. Like this reciprocity between creation and self-establishment of the concept, comprehensive design capacity and concept power can be seen in its potential to objectivize ideal projections. This means that the architectural concept is meticulously created, projected, and designed by architects in order to achieve the desired projection. Paradoxically, it is true that architecture, including individual architectural gestures, con uh, constantly displays and move what the discipline itself is grounded and built about all its own object. There are always new and further projections simultaneously by creating the architect displaces their own objects to allow for various unusual presence of the idea to track particular absence, projections of the other. Presences explained through absence, like the concept for the object or object for the concept, which was what makes architecture's discipline powerful. The essential value of concept, it is pure creative potential for new, new projections, which is to say, new concepts and new conceptions, new objects, philosophies, and aesthetic of the future. It is why the concepts gives power to the project. If we take potentiality to, as a possibility to transfer into the real, the actual, and if we determine its temporality, then the moment when something is not realized or not actualized becomes poor architecture, perhaps also philosophical creative basis. The content of concept leaves the possibility, time and space, to not be actualized, not to come about, not pass into the finite. Eisenhower's formation of project is of the project of something defining a specific spatial and temporal situation, which indicates finality taking shape in the form. Architecture, however, necessarily implies continuous movement and the construction of borders and reality. The architecture concept itself generate, generate the potential for the new and authentic by surpassing their own materialization creating in the feeling of fulfillment also at once its delay. Therefore, the real value is in the contingency of the new. For Bataille, the key to coming up with the project is delaying the time. But to Derrida, the project was proof of ideality, pre-ideal geometry, where the ideality is the idea of the object itself. It is always a matter of projection the concept will achieve in a given time and space. 
while the act of projection will take up a key place in architectural production. The project is projection of space and time. As is the object, the projection of the project, the projection of the concept. The project is a formation that we realize future existence. In this process, projection is the curse of the entire temporal sequence of creation, appearance, and realization of architecture. The architectural concept represents the first object of architecture that is projected, creating the conceptions with which it materializes its authenticity and other objects, the phenomenal form of architecture. In this infinite temporal sequence, the architectural concept is what creates the new and critically opens the question of what is to come in the time gap. And finally, I, if we have time and possibilities, I like to, want to show you my last so my last project for my studio, Ne Architecti. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm afraid that... Uh, yes, that is not... Yes, uh, so. Maybe next time. But uh, first project is my current project. Uh, I submitted uh, a few days ago for a building permission. Um, it is a project for memorial for employees of, Tate, uh, of the Tate, uh, state TV killed in 1999 bombing of Serbia. Uh, five years ago, the project won an award of intention, uh, international competition. It is about kinetic sculptures of 16 elements, 22 meters in height, representing leaves and grass swaying gently in the wind. It is a materialization of concept of endurance and lives that person is. And the second project, we have a film from Marco Brizzi for especially made for their art. I know I hope that you know for that site. And this building uh, Vila Pavlovic is complicated a few months ago. It is nominated uh, for this year for Miss Van der Rohe Award. So maybe we, uh, we can uh, see this project uh, in the year. Yeah, the year. Yes, so like uh, because yes, yes, of course. I think it, it is important, uh, important uh, because for all, especially for students, because we have two films and the second is especially made for a uh, website architecture project. Maybe we can try ah, yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, just make uh, yeah. small okay, it's much less. We can. We can appreciate something better than better. Okay. Yes. Then we arrange after we get a arrange. So maybe we, we you can uh, <coughs> you can go back and show very yes, quickly okay. what you This is the first project. It was uh, architecture comp uh, competition. My studio and architect uh, on, on this project. Now we, I hope, in the next few days we got uh, permission to build. Ah, it's, it's more, yes. 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 Yes, okay. Because it is uh, uh, 
kinetics capture, uh, capture with uh, 16 elements because in that bombing 16 young people died so for all of them one uh, piece of uh, uh, metal it is, I hope that it will work because it is very uh, technical innovation uh, because uh, of 32 meters and this, this line is a uh, bombing line in that uh, uh, and in that moment killed the people. And the second project, it's uh, Vila Pavlovich, on very one of the most popular mountain in uh, Serbia. It is uh, my uh, 20, uh, I spent years already work for that family. Also, uh, one of the projects for that family is also nominated for Miss Van der Award. It is the Textile Commercial Building. Uh, and the latest project is Vila Pavlovich. It is 60 meters long and four meters narrow uh, in cal calves. We still have some details to finish, but we are using
Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, Victor, Alessandro, for this invitation. I will start by, um, I will present a series of key points uh, and a few quotes to nourish the debate and in order to move out of this confusion between these words, concetto, disegno, progetto, intenzioni. Sorry for my Italian, it will be a Google Italian. If I make some mistakes, you will tell me. Uh, in order to see more clearly, uh, I propose to question the purpose of, of the act. What we call la finalité, French. Because uh, the, the, the topic that, uh, uh, we, that resembles, uh, reunites us today is uh, um, to understand through design what is at stake in the project. So, um, the first question I propose is um, to talk about the finalité du geste, the end of architecture, uh, lo scopo in Italian, um, and by saying that in art, and I include architecture in art, it is not about expressing, but about discovering s'exprimer ou découvrir. I mean, we can divide architects between the one that express a concept and the one that invent a solution. This latter, this last one, proceed out of a problem. What does this difference mean? To understand it, we have to make a little bit of genealogy of the project and talk about the poisoned gift handed to Western aesthetics by philosophy. Um, probably Concetto did inherit something from the myth of the idea. Uh, there is a concept with a very long pedigree, stretching back to Plato's essentialist idols. And there is a, a continuity from the idols to idea. I invite you to read the Panofsky book, Idea, if you are interested about this history. And the properties of idea are summarized in a pity sentence by the Florentine humanist Marcillo Ficino. I will quote him now. The idea is a substance, simple, unmoving, allowing of no internal contradiction. End of quote. So when we think of Vitruve's first book, when he talks about the darkness, buio in Italian, of the thoughts before accessing to a solution, uh, the, the bottega is uh, quite dark. So, the philosophy we have inherited from the uh, ancients uniformly asserts that the idea is something immediate, something directly given to consciousness, you know, the lamp in the, in the, in the cartoons, uh, something directly given in consciousness as indicated by the root idein in Greek, meaning to see. So we have on one side philosophy, which talks about immediacy, 
immediacy of the concept, immediacy of the idea. And on the other side, we have the real experience of design with a patient construction of the idea. Very different. Unfortunately, these basic philosophical principles, idea, as following Mr. Marcello Ficino, encourage us to dissociate two moments. The moment of intellectual conception from that of physical execution. And the separation of two moments do not consider the act, the action, the material action, nor the passage of time as a contributor to this objet de pensée, to this oggetto di pensiero. This time and this act will let it grow like a plant will grow with water, with light, and with time. So, when do the trouble start? The trouble starts in the age of Renaissance. I put aside the ambiguity, the ambiguousness of the design of uh, notion. The trouble starts in the age of Renaissance because this definition of uh, the idea, like something simple, immovable, etc., that appears in the mind, is, ca cannot anymore be supported. Cannot anymore be supported because um, the program of an architecture project no longer presupposes a predetermined model. I explain. Here you have typically a predetermined model, the temple. All the temples are a kind of declination of the idea of temple. But the model is very, very, very strong and the variation is very small. And on the right you have a, a, a typical Renaissance project, Michelangelo's drawing. So the project becomes an assemblage of some parts in the Renaissance, of some parts in search of a whole. In Italian, parti alla ricerca di tutto. So architectural design acquired then an exploratory function it had never clearly possessed before. That is why in Alberti's experience, as in Leonardo da Vinci's invention, arose not from an instant of inspiration, but from a period of gestation. So what does it mean? It means that times, time, the time of the mind, the time of the project, the time of the design, time becomes an added value to the oggetto di pensiero. Filarete, contemporary of Alberti, compares the project as pregnancy and the architect as a surrogate model. Here is the first lesson that emerged. The architecture world does not owe its existence to an inner image that is already complete in itself, in the mind, and, in, and which an architectural drawing then has only to transcribe in reality. The project is rather the product of a movement of thought. A movement of thought which passes through several stages at varying speeds, varying speeds of, of, of intellect, intelligence. Sometimes the time expands when there is a series of, of unsuccessful steps, each one nourished by the dissatisfaction of last one, in Italian, l'issoddisfazione dell'occhio, which is nourishing another drawing. Every drawing is, is uh, insatisfaisant, so then the time expands, is longer. And sometimes the time shrinks when there is intuitive access to solution, very rapid. It's the Kairos notion uh, or Solestia by uh, Thomas Lacan uh, that he explains by this sentence. Shrewdness is a habit <laughs> whereby congruities are discovered rapidly. And Einstein, I quote Einstein, insight is when intelligence exceeds the speed limit. So there is moments when there is a very rapid, very quick access to the solution, and sometimes also, uh, on the other hand, the time ex expands because there is a slowness. So the project faces a problem. How to manage fragments? Here you have only fragments. Michelangelo, when he designed the entrance of the uh, Laurentian library, he, he has fragments in the mind. The mind has to deal with the multiplicity of images that comes in him. Il pensiero è preso in una molteplicità. So, 
The sketch is possible as soon as the pencil and the mind and the paper book are produced and distributed in the late 15th century. So the sketch, based on the material tools of the sketch, had to make room in the mind, what the English people call uh, headspace, make room in the mind for multiplicity. And this multiplicity derives from the revolution of design and construction that is not anymore an extraction of the volume out of the plan. I just showed two images of medieval procedure that starts from obligatory, starts from a planimetric uh, view plan and extracts, extrudes the elevation out of the plan. Uh, one is uh, inspired from Villard d'Orcourt, but it's a late German drawing. And this one is the uh, Vicenzo drawing for the Duomo di Milan that, that's, that shows that Gothic procedure is uh, what would, you would call in Italian processo miope. You don't see the, the volume, you only see it through the plan. So, warrior's Renaissance architect sees far, he can see far, but through a fog, nebbia. Because he will deal directly with the multiple facets of a building, then he needs to manage the interaction between its parts, and the repeated drawing of the sketch will seek to link the parts together. So the shape of the project's thinking is less like a string of pearls than a braid, in uh, tresse, is less like a serial concatenation than an orchestration. So the process of inquiry is not always a continuous and linear process. There are accidents and sudden turns. Project exhibits a mobility and a speed which is a different, differentiated rhythm. So, uh, another aspect of slowness is the prudence. Um, when it is materialized uh, in the fuzzy representation to catch this oggetto di pensiero without crystallizing it is to represent it without reducing it. In the field of the project, uh, I will quote myself uh, about this drawing. I don't know if this is uh, if it is uh, easy in Italian to. I don't know if you can read it for me because I'm not <coughs> able to read it. Yes. Dai primi schizzi di concezione nella luce fioca di un pensiero brancolante rallentato dai dubbi. In questa gestazione che si apre a tutti i possibili, la formazione di ogni partito ipotechi la forma degli altri nello stesso momento in cui detiene la sua ragione per il profitto che promette loro sotto l'autorità del piano e diventa il moderatore di una conversazione collettiva. Thank you. So, what I wanted to say here is that the plan is therefore a kind of arbitrator. Uh, the group cross all skates of drawing and calls, calls into question a hierarchy, an a priori of the figures. Like for example, it is at this moment, I'm talking about Renaissance, évidemment, uh, that a, a plan will look for its section, or a section will look for its plan, etc. So there is no more a procedure, a real hierarchized procedure from the plan to the volume. So, it was in the 15th century that architectural practice discovered this deliberate slowness, uh, marking a step forward in the history of the architecture project from the enforced slowness of the Gothic architecture. And um, I show here uh, another example of slowness with Melnikov when he had to design seven times the pavilion in order to find the solution of the diagonal. So, what I want to say here is that from the Renaissance to, to today, there is no, it's still the same regime of, of project, projection. Uh, it is, um, so it, it questions this rejection of time, encapsulated in the idea, which is also a rejection of doubt, because when the idea says that uh, it's complete, uh, uh, unmovable, etc., there is no doubt. 
the slowness of the movement is thus explained by the need to compare the thinking to something other than itself. That is to submit one's design to the judgment of the eye, what Michelangelo calls the judicio de locio, in accordance with the laws of perception, the requires of use, etc. So, the project cultivates the ability to postpone the knowledge of the whole, also because the three-dimensional sketch can impact the plan, the idea of a section also, whereas in the Gothic process the volumes are a consequence of the plan. So the project becomes the art to move forward without having a precise goal, but without being a pure wandering. <coughs> so it becomes the art of a fragile balance between the known that guides to move and the unknown that allows the invention. To design a project is then to make a long-term investment that the Corbusier will call the patient search. Different slowness than the Gothic one. The Gothic slowness is suffered slowness. It's not a deliberate slowness. You are obliged to be slow. I will come back to these two issues later. Another point bears on the uniqueness of the kind of knowledge that this movement of thought calls for. What is it? Um, the gestation operates uh, in a way uh, that all theories of architecture project are often uh, incapable to catch, to define. Um, because usually the theories of architecture say that the process is either from the progression from the confused to the clear, or the, from the simple to the compound, or from the vague to the precise, or from the general to the particular. Whereas the architectural design in reality reflects a more complicated experience, in which one can assess, access, assess, sorry, uh, what one perceives with qualitative precision at each stage, stage, stage of the process, yet without knowing what geometrical formula might represent this qualitative precision. So there is qualitative precision uh, with, from the beginning. The difference be between the beginning and the end might be described as a gradual inverting of the initially unclear concept, if you want, in a mysterious yet obvious way Mysterious in the sense that explaining it will call for analysis. So let's step aside a little bit. Uh, what can human mind do with a lot of freedom that he, this, that he access to in the Renaissance period? Um, let's look at three unexpected, unexpected works, totally unexpected at the moment of their creation but that appear necessary afterwards, I mean, historically speaking. Just to, because the, the big question behind the concetto and, and design is the invention. What do these three works do, each one in its field? The music, uh, literature, or a painting? What do these works do? They reveal the sickness of things, the sickness of ideas, they deepen our experience of the world. They have the privilege, these works, of being both bright and enigmatic. Why wouldn't the architectural project have the right to do the same? Why wouldn't the architect project be entitled to do it also? So, pay yourself this privilege implies overtaking. Um, this is why when we design a project, when you write a book, when you realize a movie, we can do, we can please, we can do an object that pleases, cautiously adapted to the dominant taste of the time, of the present, or we can disturb our idea of art and shake up our knowledge. The question is, what is expected, how, what is expected of a work of art, of a work of architecture? Open an enigma which means give weight in literature to the words, in music to the sounds, in painting to the colors, and in architecture give weight to the walls we inhabit. 
So the big question is invention and its intellectual and material conditions. What is, in, what is invention? Through lecture, through readings, through experience of design, and through experience of teaching, I am convinced that it is an accumulation of thought, a cumul de pensée in French, to get what I would call a dark matter uh, at the end. This experience of, uh, of the success uh, is the invention of an order. Uh, which requires some, uh, some tools. I, um, about the genealogy of the project, there is this book I wrote out of the thesis with the help of Pierre also and, uh, and my, and my uh, and PhD director, Daniela Haas. Um, so, um, it, the material and intellectual tools for invention are both necessary because the two means support each other. Neither thought nor drawing are, are enough to their own. Where does it come? It comes from the, uh, the, the fact that drawing frees itself from the building site, uh, from the privacy of measurements on the discrete measure by the scale drawing. So the scale drawing that appears at the Renaissance also uh, will free the drawing from the uh, construction logic. So the line of architecture frees itself from the compass and there is a shift from the site to the workshop, to the bottega. Design is no longer in the sphere of the construction site with its empirical methods uh, that uh, feeling one's way took place, but in the world of the drawing and its heuristic exploratory method. Research-based sketches, which emerge at the same time as the concept of disegno, push thinking to examine, to examine the range of options, to consider the possibility of several different representations, various possible representations, that will start to conflict uh, and, uh, and, and to uh, slow down the rhythm of the project. I put aside the perspective uh, paradigm because I tried to show that it was the sketch and not the perspective that really disrupts at the Renaissance the rhythm and uh, the process of the design. The experience of a freedom. Here you, you see that uh, in the Milano uh, uh, construction, they started building the, the building with the foundations and the plant, and they had no idea about the section. They had no idea about the heights of the different key points of the, of the building. So, um, this freedom that appears at the Renaissance um, are, put, are put back today, because we need to talk about also the present, um, our, 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 our um, question uh, by the primacy of the discrete measurements in uh, computer-assisted design. That requires early precision and do not have a scale. Secondly, this is, so, so the first thing is the, uh, the, the um, primacy of the discrete measurements that come back with the computer. Second is a return of the site, a return of its logic and its procedure through the BIM, Building Information and Modeling. So the question is how to redeploy a playground, a, a, a margin of liberty in designing. Manual drawing has proven its efficiency. Computer drawing provides productive power indisputably superior to that of hand drawing. But what about its heuristic power? It's, is it comparable to that of the intuitive sketch? It's a question, not an answer. Um, in the, in the very, very funny movie that uh, Louise Lemoine made on the house of her parents in Bordeaux by Rem Collas, uh, there is a, a 
the end there is the coda, and Kulas is looking at the movie, very apparently very upset about the result, and and he say uh, that there is a reduction of language today, so he makes like a general comment about architecture today, about the excessive simplification which impoverishes architecture. And he put the cause to the computer assisted design and to the market also, which leads to seduce by a superficial singularity instead of a real singularity. And the digital which smooths, uniforms the language. So the tradition and the ambition of the architect is then reduced to a tiny thing. This is a multi multifactorial narrowing. So, um, what, what did the designio do? This, this designio that is today uh, remis en question by the, 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 digi the digital revolution. The designio wrapped, wrapped the work in drawing. There is patience and wisdom, and, and, the, and better, more than the race to make a buzz that comes from the communication. And this weakens to the benefit, uh, to the benefit of another productive culture. So, um, two, uh, the blue is di di to dimension, dimensioning, and here is mesuring. This is two drawings I like to show to, to separate, to distinguish between uh, dimensionné, which is the engineer's job, and mesuré, which is the architect's uh, responsibility. Um, the sketch has an immediate link between the head and the brain. It's about speed. There is no loss between the mind and the hand during the sketch. More than that, not only there is no loss, but there is an added value, there is a coefficient empowering us, we can do more than we know at the end. We can do more than we know, and that's the magic of the architectural dimension. Because it's a passage from one knowledge to another knowledge, from mental virtual knowledge to material and real knowledge. And it's also a transfer. One thing I will quote um, Georges Braque, the painter. One thing cannot be two places at a time. We cannot have it in mind and under the eyes. So there is a balance of power between the body. I include the organs, the organs and the two. Um, and uh, the, between the body and the two, sorry. Uh, the digital challenges uh, the traditional definition of the tool. Uh, again, I will have to quote Brack. Before, the tool was the ex extension of the hand. With the machinism, the hand has become the extension of the tool. It is a real subject today, and we know more than ever, with the artificial intelligence about there is a, a threat on a human sovereignty. So, um, a transition. Le dessin comme outil de connaissance. Drawing as knowledge tool. Observation drawing as superior knowledge feeds the design drawing. Uh, 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 Paul Valéry used to say, when I started to draw the, the nose of my best friend, I discovered that I didn't know the face of my best friend. Because trying to redesign the the, the nose of my best friend reveals that I don't really know. And so de designing is an, a second knowledge more solid than the first one that is only receptive. So how to deal, how to handle arbitrariness, how to discipline it, how to enlighten it. There is a good and there is a bad arbitrary. Sorry to be Manichaean, but I believe in it or rather a good use and a misuse of freedom. Um, because even in the belt of the constraints, there is a multiplicity of possibilities. I do not believe at this sentence take zoning as a design concept. This is totally uh, abandoning architectural intelligence. So the art of um, getting lost, but without going astray, 
I mean, do not crystallize precociously the form in gestation, but without wandering and abandoning the line to pure contingency. So project, architecture project, uh, is the encounter of a method and a subjectivity. And subjectivity feeds on intuition. Intuition is called by Bergson an almost extinct lamp. Una lampada quasi extinta. It's a very fragile thing that our mission as a teacher of architecture is to protect and to accompany without violence. Uh, so the method has this, uh, this uh, responsibility. And in this, the sketch is the best friend of thought because it bends to follow the mind. Its economy, the economy of the sketch, is coming in tune with the state of thought. The economy and the austerity are fundamental. The sketch has a capacity of confusion. It is very important confusion. The more an idea prepares something big, the more confused it is at its beginning. The sketch reflects this confusion. So, uh, designing is overcoming the disorder of thought, not to conjure it or be captive of it. I am in the favorite city of Nietzsche, so I have to quote it. Um, voila, this is the quote. One must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. So this is to rehabilitate confusion in the, in the early stage of a design project. Confusion uh, comes precisely from the fact that one puts oneself in danger, that there is a gap between what one knows and what one undertakes to conceive. From the known to the unknown. If there is no gap, if there is no confusion, there is no gap, and there is no that invention, because invention is revealing an unknown. So there is darkness because there is negativity in design. Uh, that is why it's not a question of expressing an idea. Why there is negativity? Let's quote Albert. The eyes insistently claim what is absent than what they appreciate what is present. Uh, and Jean de Buffet, five uh, centuries later, asserts that the artist <coughs> walks back turned to the result. So, this movement of thought that is designed um, is a move that is moving forward in the darkness of what awaits him, as opposed to the conceptual architecture. This is Ronchamp, the darkness of the idée obscure du début. And this is typically the beginning, for me, uh, of this uh, trend today of conceptual architecture. It's the endless tower of uh, Jean Nouvel, which is only a transcription of uh, a, a, a notion. So, uh, to challenge the impossible, and so the confusion in its momentum towards the unread, in audito, in Italian, and in this, the drawing accompanies without fail the bits of thought, the fragmented thoughts, that makes the project a research. We do not draw the shape, but what can lead us to the shape when we draw. So we lose a lot of time. We lose a lot of time. It was the, the, the Carnet de Feuillet uh, and the 15th century. The paper, the industry of the paper allow this uh, gaspillage, this uh, cons consumption of, uh, of trials. And it, then, the, the second tool that took the, the place of the paper was the role of uh, tracing paper. It's a kind of traveling, like in the movie, a traveling of thought, unrolled, continuous search. It's part of the framework of the playground. So negativity 
is both in the design process and in the perfection to which it aspires. I quote again Alberti. We will attach ourselves to this advice of Socrates, namely to hold for the best that which by itself is, no, is so well constituted that it cannot be modified if no less well. This, the definition of harmony uh, inspired from Socrates. So there is negativity, you see. Uh, so uh, designing is a subtle melange, melange, melange of uh, slowness and rapidity. Uh, on the noetic level, there is slowness, déjà, uh, on the noetic level, because there is a uh, rumination, infusion. Uh, uh, you have, uh, il faut laisser la pensée. Dobbiamo soppesare il pensiero. And um, there is a delay, ritardo, of the idea, which is already observed in the delay of the first line. You have to hold the act in order to give weight to the act when the act will come. Alberti recalls that in painting, uh, a long mental rumination precedes the act of the sketch. And Le Corbusier says exactly the same. He says, when I have a project to design, I stay, I force myself not to draw any line for a long period. I ruminate like the tea infusion, you know, and when it's full, 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 when it it's, will explode, then I start drawing. So I don't lose my time by, uh, you know, in uh, errance. So the reward of this slowness, there is a reward, is in the speed that awaits it when the hand will translate. So once nature, the mind calls for a drawing flow which makes the idea explode. And the drawing must be weighted, not being an accidental wandering but a delivery. Designing is a delivery at some point. So uh, I like to show contemporary uh, examples. Here is Fujimoto. Uh, you can see we can accumulate failed attempts. Here it's the same like sketches, but it's in models. It's exactly, exactly the same. It's more costly because there is carton. Uh, <laughs> he has to buy a lot of uh, carton paper and also. But it's exactly the same. So we can accumulate failed attempts provided we succeed at the end. It's like in Woody Allen, the right answer. He consume a lot of uh, bobine because he want to have exactly the right tone when there is a, a réplique in the phrase. So uh, its uh, studies are, and trials are never a mismanagement if they make it possible to arrive at a quality. The problem at Fujimoto is that when you see the quantity of the trials, and you look at the result, you see that there is a problem, the result is deceiving. So, another uh, statement is uh, singularity versus ready-made models. Uh, since Vitruve, from Vitruve to the BIM, Building Informational Modeling, we know that uh, architect had to select and to dispose it is more complicated than that because the order is a grammar, the beam is a catalog. Okay, but from far we can say that there are always have always been ready-made in architecture. So it's very very diffi difficult to uh, to access to a singularity. It is very difficult. It is very brave, and it is very perilous. Another statement is to uh, to. Uh, To get out of the site, bousculer le site. Um, the architectural project can jostle, in Italian, spin tone, spin tone the site, like the Malabate, Casa Malabate, or the Douglas House, that are totally stranger to their concept, context. But on the other hand, the contrary, here is the uh, they become, this house, one with the site. They look like a, a shrimp, uh, how do you say shrimp in Italian? Uh, not shrimp, um, champignon, uh, fungo, voilà. Uh, so in both cases, there is an obviousness of the building, 
but with very different means. Uh, obviousness is always a posteriori. And here, another uh, right building, it's Bosun House, uh, which looks like a telluric thrust in desert stone and wood. <coughs> another statement is the, <coughs> the order of the plan. Plan became um, <coughs> plan has um, in the traditional design is plan is ignographia. Ignos is the trace of the walking of the walks, and then it became partitio in Alberti's uh, tra treatise. And this tradition of ignographia, we have it very clearly presented in the analysis by Choisy of the uh, Acropolis, and it is not a hazard if uh, Eisenstein, which is a famous monteur, uh, was interested by this uh, procession of uh, mise-en-scene of the objects on the Acropolis. Because um, in design there is... Uh, well, I'm showing all this because design has to do with plan, and plan has to do with su succession of spatial scenes through the walk. And this succession of spatial scenes through the walk uh, uh, has a law of eff the effect they do on us, is, is, is inspired from, I think, I mean, it has to do with the Kuleshov effect in the movie, which, which says that uh, this image is the same, but its significance depends not on itself, but on the image precedent. So if it's a dish, it's appetite, if it's a, a, a dead body, it's sadness, if it's a, a late woman but living, it's a desire. So uh, in, in, in the plan it's exactly the same because the, the, the crossing the different rooms of a building will uh, define the effect of, a, of a, one of them depending on the precedence. So all this is totally uh, mise en question. How do you say mise en question in Italian? Huh? Mise en question by the, another, another culture of the project, which is uh, in, uh, very in, uh, nourished by the beam, that make the plan not the ethnographia, not the uh, narration of a spaces, but uh, I, I, I model something directly 3D and then I cut it when it's done. So the plan becomes the, the consequence of a 3D form, not the meditation of spatio-temporal experience. Very, very different. So this is the, the danger uh, aspect. Uh, another statement, because I just make statements, huh? it's very uh, papillon, huh? it's not very uh, linear. Uh, do not tell stories. Uh, what is seen premium on what has been planned. Uh, there is this uh, anecdote by uh, Khan that when he was designing the Salk Institute, he had a concept in mind. And uh, he wanted a garden here. So every time he put trees in the model, and it doesn't work, he removed them. He put them somewhere, uh, another order of trees. And every time, every layout of garden in this space uh, was not satisfactory to him. So he called Baragan. Baragan came and he tells, look, I, I don't know, I want to do this garden. And Baragan tells him, you remove everything. You leave it mineral and you just welcome the sky. And Baragan was right. So what happened with Khan is that he had something in mind, but the judgment of his eye was always telling him it's not working. So in project, we have to have humility and accept to listen to what is in front of our eyes and not impose a, 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 a predetermined idea that will not uh, succeed. Uh, I will end now with my last. Um, uh, L'évidence is the reward of the time spent, obviousness. Uh, it, it is very ingrat. Ingrato, because it gives the impression, obviousness, that it was easy to invent. So, architecture invention 
is paradoxical because at the end it looks like it has been simple, but it was in fact very, very difficult to uh, invent. And when um, obviousness has to do also, how do we, everybody recognize that this is a church in 55, but it do not imitate any sign of an existing church before. So how do you say that how this obviousness works without imitation, without analogy? So how to get to the essence of the church without going through the images of the church already done before? So this is invention. You get immediately to talk about the Platonician language. You go immediately to the idea of the church. You don't. So it's exactly the same with Picasso. Picasso said, I often paint portraits that bear no resemblance to the original, and everyone can tell who it is. Everyone recognizes, but there is no at all resemblance. So, um, what I wanted to say to resume is what is unknown is just as important and what is known as what is known. And, um, and that freedom has nothing to do with this impetuous stroke of the pencil, uh, but, um, uh, let it, but try to let it come, get out of the anguish of the blank page. The drawing favors a gears as and when there are more and more lines determining the following ones. Pierre Reverdy used to say, it is not about making an image, it must arrive on its own wings. All this is about the a posteriori evidence. Okay, I will go further, I will still have a few more, I will stop for a few minutes. Um, a pure spatial narrative is the courage of the house. And um, also, uh, design is very, uh, today, there is a, um, um, what I call the false crisis of the geometri the geometral, the planimetric views, uh, plan, section, elevation, but it's dangerous as a false crisis, because there was this, uh, you know, uh, this architecture non-standard that uh, in few, a few decades ago had a lot of success, uh, uh, which uh, encourages a false, daring, as non-standard architecture to think that transgression can be accomplished by the simple rejection of Cartesian geometry is a deception. Voila. I show students of... <laughs> I'm going to show the project. I will show my students uh, uh, work with uh, plans and section and there is a multiplicity, how uh, one and multiple at the same time is the, the, the pleasure of architecture. Uh, politically, also, um, designing is pursuing a project uh, and to fight the heterogeneity of the conditions that determine the organization of the built world, both in its comp component parts and as a whole, by imposing a conceptual unity, capable of reuniting the elements broken up by the standardization of components and by and discontinuity of operations that typify the construction process. And when the work is complete and the building as a whole becomes visible, the unity of its design transcends the indiscriminate allocation of construction tasks that prevented the building crew from grasping the overall meaning of the work they were doing. So, the project stands for the convergence and the purposefulness of the construction work in contrast to the sequence of individual operations which follows the job breakdown of the contractor's spec sheets. In a sense, the architectural project restores, restores to the workers something they lost in the course of the 18th century rationalization of the workplace in aid of greater efficiency, 
to the detriment of the craft guilds. We know that one of the drama of the architecture since uh, three, three centuries is that the worker do not see the finality of what he's doing because it's totally standardized. And I like this sentence and I will end by this quote by Le Corbusier. When Bona, it's the worker called Bona, when Bona raised the cross onto his shoulder to carry it to the middle of the nave behind the altar, of a, all of a sudden everyone began to choke up to make jokes. So much so that the workers, the team, no, sorry, to choke up means he had so emotion, he was so emotion that he had his, his uh, ear uh, suffocare. suffocare. <laughs> All of a sudden, everyone began to choke up so much so that the workers, the team, started making jokes to stop themselves from suffocating. So this is why I like to pay tribute to this uh, work and the uh, fact that the, the unity that is perceived at the end reconciles the worker with the architect. For me, it's not a problem to, to speak now or to, yeah, now to speak uh, yeah. after. Yeah. As you like. Yeah. I would just ask one very practical question because we are much more than expected. So, of those who are attending, who would like to join for lunch? Because we thought we were less people ever. <laughs> Don't have any present video presentation. No, just no presentation. Only speech without the images. Non signis sed verbis. There is a, a French expression which fits well to my text. Uh, this expression is, is that the, the, the most handsome boy in the world, the most gorgeous girl in the world, gives only the she or he has. I'm not architect. I can't explain to you how to successfully project, but I try to, to sketch the place and also the power of project in the inte intellectual culture of our time. Alors, je, je commencerai par donner la définition du projet par Alberti. Peter, vous avez commencé à le faire. Donc, con, concevoir comme si, par avance, en esprit, trahir, scriber, in mente, ac animo, trahir, in latin, c'est avant. Euh, dans le moindre détail, ex omni parte, l'ensemble de l'œuvre, par des lignes et des angles, glineis et angulis, de façon abstraite, c'est-à-dire sans inscription matérielle, seclusa materia, seclusa materia, jusqu'à ce que l'œuvre, à force de rumination, dira le corbusier, à force de ressassement, dit Alberti, Iterum et iterum, l'éternel recommencement de la conception, tombe comme un fruit mûr, 
de l'esprit de l'architecte. Et le mouvement moderne y ajoutera une dimension idéaliste, et je crois que c'est important, en tant que le projet dans le mouvement moderne est l'outil privilégié de progression, de progrès, d'émancipation, de transformation de la société. Vous savez, il y a un livre, un recueil d'articles célèbres d'Arban, qui s'appelle « Projet et destin »,« Un projet et destin », qui signifie clairement cette fonction destinale du projet dans euh, le mouvement de l'autre, dans la conception, dans l'idéologie du mouvement de l'autre. Alors, le projet qui chez Alberti est un outil technique, un outil mental, au service de la conception des artefacts, des œuvres d'art, devient dans le mouvement moderne un opérateur de nature historique, politique et sociale. Alors la question, je ne vais pas la développer, mais pour ouvrir le dialogue avec les, les deux conférences pré précédentes, est-ce que le projet est un outil ou un objet Plus exactement, quelle est la relation de, entre l'outil et l'objet Je pense que c'est une question qui ne méritera débat probablement cet après-midi. Le projet... Or, oh, et ça c'est la, la deuxième remarque que j'aimerais faire, le projet est devenu une conception de plus en plus négligée par la théorie contemporaine, une conception dans laquelle la société ne reconnaît plus ce qui fait la fonction architecturale. Et donc je félicite les organisateurs de ce séminaire d'avoir remis au premier plan une notion qui, pour de nombreuses raisons, est, euh, est un peu passée en arrière depuis, euh, depuis une ou deux décennies, une ou deux, oui, depuis une vingtaine d'années. Euh, et de fait, il y a un paradoxe. Il n'y a évidemment pas d'architecture sans projet pour des raisons pratiques pour des raisons économiques, pour des raisons juridiques. On ne peut pas construire, évidemment, sans livrer ce que dans le, le vocabulaire de la construction en France, on appelle un avant-projet sommaire, ou en, puis un avant-projet détaillé. Ce sont des, hein, ce sont des, des, des termes de, juridiques pour le permis de construire. Donc, le projet, c'est une réalité pratique, juridique, économique, mais, mais euh, l'architecture contemporaine, ou en tout cas sa théorie, sa théorie ne place plus sa puissance poétique et symbolique dans le projet, au contraire de, du mouvement moderne ou de l'architecture de la Renaissance. Pour l'architecture de la Renaissance, le projet est aussi une question fondamentale où l'architecture s'identifie. Le, le projet n'est plus le lieu où l'architecture s'identifie par son discours. Il devient une tâche secondaire au demeurant en voie d'automatisation et ça c'est une question importante dans, dans les agents. On dira peu importe Tant que le projet reste au cœur de la réalité quotidienne de l'architecture, sauf que, précisément parce que le projet apparaît comme accessoire marginal du point de vue des valeurs qui instituent l'architecte sur la scène sociale, eh bien, on n'hésite pas à l'automatiser, à le sous-traiter, à l'intelligence artificielle, à la conception assistée par ordinateur, à le sous-traiter à des machines, au point de dégrader plus encore sa valeur symbolique, dans une sorte de cercle vicieux, plus le projet est dégradé symboliquement, plus il est prêt à être automatisé, et plus il est automatisé, moins l'architecte est appelé à s'y reconnaître et à s'y investir. Alors, on entend de plus en plus dans le discours architectural contemporain des références aux logiques floues, à l'aléatoire, aux théories du chaos, aux réseaux, 
voir Horizo, tout un vocabulaire tiré de la philosophie, de l'épistémologie ou des sciences sociales contemporaines. Ces nouveaux discours sont censés acter la mort du projet et de la raison de l'intelligence productive que le projet manifeste. Et si ces discours prétendent liquider le projet et s'y substituer, c'est parce que le projet passe pour un carcan mental, une prison, Cartier, une prison mentale, qui inhibe, qui limite les potentialités de l'architecture que favorise, que favorise aujourd'hui l'informatique et les nouveaux matériaux. De fait, ces discours prétendent libérer l'architecture d'elle-même la libérer de son passé, la libérer de ses rêves, de ses patterns qui l'entraveraient et qui l'empêcheraient de se renouveler. En tant que tel, ces nouveaux discours se veulent une critique de l'architecture et de sa tradition, et même une critique révolutionnaire, une critique interne qui dénonce dans l'architecture son isolement, son enfermement, dont le projet serait le symptôme, son absence de réactivité au mouvement social, aux nouveautés technologiques ou sociétales, son enfermement souverain dans sa seule logique disciplinaire, voire corporatiste. On lui reproche aujourd'hui ce que Nietzsche jugeait comme la preuve de sa grandeur, c'est-à-dire sa souveraine distance. Dans le crépuscule des idoles, Nietzsche donne une définition de l'architecture particulièrement intéressante et inactuelle, au sens où Nietzsche utilisait cette, cette expression intempestive, il dit la puissance, l'architecture c'est la puissance qui n'a plus besoin de démonstration, qui dédaigne de plaire, qui répond difficilement, qui ne se sent pas de témoin autour d'elle. Vous voyez combien cette définition de l'architecture par Nietzsche est très éloigné des critères sociaux contemporains, qui, sans en avoir conscience, vit des objections qu'on fait contre elle, qui repose sur soi-même de façon fatale, loi parmi les lois, et il conclut, cette architecture-là, c'est le grand style. C'est une notion majeure, évidemment, dans la philosophie Nietzsche. En réaction, Georges Bataille, qui est pourtant un, un, un grand lecteur de Nietzsche, va prendre le, 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 véritablement, on va s'opposer à, à, à Nietzsche. Quand il fait de l'architecture, la, et je cite un texte que Bataille a publié dans cette revue qu il, euh, dont il était le rédacteur en chef, Document. Donc c'est le numéro 2 de Document. C'est un texte de 1929. Et il dit « L'architecture est l'expression de l'ordre et de l'autorité. » Il compare les grands monuments à des digues. Et il dit des digues qui opposent la logique de la majesté et de l'autorité à tous les éléments troubles. L'ordre humain est dans l'origine solidaire de l'ordre architectural qui n'en est que le développement. De sorte, conclut-il, que les productions monumentales sont actuellement les véritables maîtres sur toute la Terre. De façon un peu hegelienne, les objets de l'esprit ont pris le pouvoir sur la productivité même de l'esprit. Les véritables maîtres sur toute la Terre, et il conclut en utilisant une formule très forte, il parle de chaume, Architecture. Alors, Schurm, c'est un terme un peu savant français, c'est le, le capot, c'est le, 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 le chef de prison qui tient tout, tout le monde sous clé. Voilà. Et pour lui, pour Bataille, l'architecture, c'est la Schurm de la société, c'est ce qui tient toute la société sous clé. Et donc, vous voyez, c'est magnifique, ça, ce dialogue entre Nietzsche et Bataille, une bataille qui est certainement l'un des plus grands interprètes de Nietzsche au XXe siècle. Mais là, sur ce point-là, sur la question de l'architecture, il y a un différent radical entre Nietzsche et son plus grand interprète. Donc, je pense que ça, c'est quelque chose qui mérite d'être médité. Alors, tout cela, 
Évidemment, cette chourme architecturale étant évidemment liée au projet, au principe de raison qui est en quelque sorte la clé de cette prison dont l'architecture est le gardien, donc étant liée au projet, au principe de raison, au Gestel dira à Heidegger et à Monta, il faut, il faut relier le texte de euh, Bataille de 1929 à l'expression heideggerienne de Gestel hein, qui date de 1948. Hein, exactement hein, une génération hein, entre les deux, les deux textes. Bon, aujourd'hui, alors, on, on est en droit de prendre un peu de recul et de dire, mais aujourd'hui, les véritables maîtres, ce ne sont pas les architectures, ce sont les réseaux, ce sont les réseaux financiers, et non pas la planification des ingénieurs de l'entre-deux-guerres. Et l'architecture elle-même est de plus en plus prise dans des logiques de promotion immobilière. De l'architecture au réseau, c'est évidemment une révolution fondamentale dans les logiques de domination. Alors, pour s'adapter à ces nouvelles logiques de domination par les réseaux, on promeut de plus en plus aujourd'hui une architecture ouverte, souple, ductile, réactive, capable de se fondre dans la praxis multiforme de la société. Il y a ici l'idée que l'architecture et la société doivent s'entre-libérer. Voilà. Et c'est une belle idée. De ce double mouvement de libération de la société de l'architecture, de l'architecture par la société, mais aussi de la société par l'architecture. C'est un peu l'inverse de ce que dit Bataille. Pour Bataille, l'architecture est l'expression par laquelle l'homme aliène sa propre liberté sous l'effet de sa volonté de puissance. C'est l'instrument privilégié de l'auto-aliénation de l'homme par son surmoi. Il s'agit alors dans le discours, dans le discours contemporain, et, et il, faut, il importe de réfléchir, il s'agit au contraire de renverser ce rapport. Mais dans le discours contemporain, dans ce processus d'entre-libération, il y aurait un, implicitement un ordre à suivre, il faut d'abord libérer la société de la domination architecturale, de la, de la rationalité du projet et de ses logiques abstraites de contrôle du territoire, avant que l'architecture, une fois la société libérée de l'architecture, et grâce à cette libération, avant que l'architecture se trouve à son tour libérée de sa propre volonté de puissance qui la, qui la rend stérile, se trouve ainsi libérée de son auto-aliénation de son auto-restriction par rapport à ce qu'elle peut, par rapport à la puissance de libération et d'utopie que l'architecture porte en elle, mais que le projet confie, réduit. Voilà donc tout un discours qu'on entend hein, euh, dans la théorie contemporaine. Et c'est pour ça que j'utilise le conditionnel. C'est ainsi que l'architecture serait capable de retrouver dans le monde contemporain son rôle d'avant-garde dans les transformations sociales comme le revendiquait en son temps le mouvement moderne. Il reste que ce type de critique, aussi intéressante soit-elle, reste à mes yeux un peu trop idéaliste. Je veux dire par là qu'elle oublie que l'architecture est un art social, et social non seulement parce qu'elle s'adresse mieux que la plupart des autres arts à la collectivité, mais aussi on l'oublie trop souvent parce qu'elle est un art de la commande, un art de la maîtrise d'ouvrage, aussi bien que de la maîtrise d'œuvre, et qu'elle reste en tant que telle fortement soumise à l'extériorité économique, technique ou politique qu'exprime ce que j'appelle le dispositif constructif. Dispositif constructif, c'est l'ensemble des acteurs qui participent à l'acte de la construction. Alors non seulement l'architecte, évidemment, mais euh, les, les, les entreprises de construction, les bureaux d'études, les consultants, les promoteurs, les filiales immobilières des banques, les directions immobilières des grandes entreprises. Vous voyez, le monde de la construction, de dispositifs constructifs, est beaucoup plus large que ce qu'on entend, évidemment, par 
architecture. Hein. Donc il faut aussi faire le, le point entre ces deux, ces deux notions, architecture d'un côté, architecte, et puis de l'autre, le dispositif constructif, la société dans sa puissance de construction. Et il est clair que le dispositif constructif cherche à exploiter l'architecture, à la servir à ses propres fins d'exploitation. Il n'y aura donc pas de libération de l'architecture s'il n'y a pas d'abord une libération par rapport au système productif qui la détermine. Et je dirais que le projet architectural a pour tâche de libérer l'architecture de sa soumission au système productif. Vous voyez, ma position, elle est différente. Je dis que si on veut libérer l'architecture de, hein, des jeux de domination, donc elle peut être l'instrument elle-même, eh bien, il faut d'abord libérer l'architecture du, du, du business, de la construction, encore de l'urbite. Il faut libérer l'architecture du business de la construction. Et il me semble que le projet, eh bien, est un instrument qui peut opérer cette libération. Je ne pense pas qu'il en a nécessairement tous les moyens, mais intellectuellement, le projet, et historiquement, historiquement, le projet a toujours été un instrument de libération par rapport aux forces économiques et politiques de la construction. Voilà, Donc ça c'est quelque chose qui est un peu oublié, qui est un peu négligé, et, et, et qu'il importe certainement de remettre un peu en lumière dans euh, ce moment de prolifération constructive que, que connaît la, la mondialisation urbaine. Alors je vais revenir sur cette idée d'entre-libération de la société et de l'architecture, même si je la conçois un peu différemment. Alors pour le premier point, il n'y a de libération que de l'entre-libération. Ça, c'est position théorique. Toute libération est d'abord entre libération. On ne se libère qu'en qu centre libérant, c'est-à-dire en libérant par sa propre libération ce qui vous aliène de sa propre aliénation. Ou pour le dire de façon plus concrète, en se libérant du système productif capitaliste, l'homme libérerait, j'utilise le conditionnel, la production du capitalisme. Voilà, c'est ça. Quand on se libère d'une chose, on, il faut, on ne la détruit pas, mais on la libère de sa propre aliénation. Et on la maintient. Et, et ce faisant, on lui donne un avenir, on lui donne un projet, si j'ose dire. Il y a une dynamique de la liberté, un cercle vertueux, la liberté engendre la liberté. Simplement, avant de libérer la société de la domination architecturale, précisément pour libérer les potentialités de l'architecture, et je suis d'accord sur, sur ce programme, sur ce projet, eh bien, eh bien Nietzsche a tout de même un petit peu raison, il faut aussi libérer l'architecture de la société, et j'entends par société quelque chose de très pragmatique, son organisation économique et sociale où s'insère l'architecture. En espérant qu'une fois libérée, l'architecture, à son tour, libère la société de sa soumission au système productif, c'est-à-dire contribue. Et je m'explique hein, ce que j'entends par libérer l'homme de la, la, la domination du système productif. Eh bien, ça, cela signifie contribuer à ce que le système productif n'implique plus la mobilisation totale des hommes ni l'arraisonnement du monde et voilà mon utopie. Il ne suffit donc pas pour faire avancer l'architecture, pour enrichir ses logiques de conception, pour approfondir l'intelligence de ses formes, il ne suffit donc pas d'en faire la critique interne, mais il faut aussi être en mesure d'influencer, de transformer la commande, de transformer le dispositif constructif, de transformer le business qui la conditionne. Or, je considère que le type de discours Postmoderne ou contemporain, peu importe comment on qualifie les, les, les références aux logiques fluides, à l'aléatoire, aux théories du chaos, au réseau, voire au réseau, contribuent sans doute par une ruse de la raison, contribuent donc plutôt à renforcer la soumission de l'architecture à la commande, à l'industrie du, du bâtiment, 
bien plus qu'elle ne vivait l'architecture de ses entrailles. J'ose affirmer de façon un peu polémique que le discours dit contemporain en architecture affaiblit le maître d'œuvre par rapport à la maîtrise d'ouvrage et au dispositif constructif. Pour le dire autrement et de façon un peu polémique, on ne libère pas la société en aliénant ou en soumettant les arts à ces discours régulateurs ou organiques. Et c'est en quoi le projet comme forme symbolique et non simplement comme outil technique garde sa valeur parce qu'il a été dès son origine un instrument de libération de l'art par rapport au dispositif politique et économique de la production. Une bonne critique de l'architecture ne peut être qu'à la fois interne et externe. La discipline ne peut bouger, ne peut s'ouvrir et se nourrir de la richesse des innombrables praxis sociales qui la traversent que si elle reste en mesure à son tour d'influencer et de modifier l'extériorité de la commande. Il ne sert à rien de remettre en cause la dimension dogmatique de l'architecture si c'est au bout du pont pour la soumettre au savoir non moins dogmatique de l'ingénieur, du sociologue, de l'économiste, voire du politique, de l'élu ou du promoteur immobilier. Se fait jour ici un risque de désidentification de l'architecture qui constitue à mon sens la menace la plus dangereuse sur sa capacité de transformation sociale. Et c'est en quoi la notion de projet a encore des choses à nous apporter. Alors, j'ai une dernière partie un peu théorique sur la raison pour laquelle le projet n'est pas facile à placer, à postuler aujourd'hui. Pourquoi il faut reconstruire ou redémontrer à chaque fois la nécessité de la place du projet dans les enjeux intellectuels et pragmatiques contemporains. Et de fait, on est à cet égard dans une situation radicalement différente de la Renaissance, parce que la Renaissance a forgé des instruments théoriques et pratiques du projet, et on a cité, vous avez cité, Alberti, Filaret, Filaret est très important pour la compréhension du projet, c'est un auteur majeur et extrêmement détaillé dans sa conception du projet. Voilà. Et à la Renaissance, la question du projet s'impose par sa nouveauté même et par ses promesses de maîtrise du réel. Le projet marque la naissance d'une véritable méthode de conception et de réalisation technique qui n'a pas d'équivalent jusqu'alors dans l'histoire de la raison. C'est vraiment une invention aussi importante, que les aussi importante pour la question de la technique que les découvertes de Galilée pour la question de la physique. C'est une invention mentale qui va profondément transformer le rapport des hommes au réel. Voilà. Et ça, ça se joue Quattrocento, Cinquecento, avant Galilée. Avant Galilée. Aujourd'hui, et on pourrait expliquer comment le mouvement moderne a retrouvé au début du XXe siècle le sens originel du projet, tel que la Renaissance l'a fait émerger et tel que l'École des Beaux-Arts de Paris au XIXe siècle l'a étouffé. Voilà. Donc il y a dans le mouvement moderne un, 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 quelque chose qui est véritablement rinacitar, qui est vraiment de l'ordre de la Renaissance dans tous les sens du terme. Alors aujourd'hui, Évidemment, il est moins aisé de repérer le projet architectural dans la situation de la rationalité contemporaine. C'est pourquoi le projet ne s'impose plus a priori, mais qu'il faut tracer un chemin pour le justifier, ce qui, au demeurant, ne peut que contribuer à une meilleure compréhension de son opérativité. De fait, aujourd'hui, d'autres formes de logique semblent s'imposer comme modèle de la raison. On assiste d'abord à une sophistication des rationalités traditionnelles. Les logiques formelles qui dépassent et de loin en précision rationnelle, mais non pas en puissance imaginative, qui dépassent le projet architectural. On assiste aussi à l'émergence de nouvelles approches non linéaires de la rationalité, les logiques floues, les systèmes complexes, les théories du chaos. Enfin, le projet semble victime de son succès. Il est partout question de projet, non seulement dans la vie de l'entreprise, 
mais même dans la vie quotidienne, toutes les questions de projet au risque finalement de dissoudre cette notion jusqu'à la rendre banale et ineffective. Dans ces conditions de manque de repères, on comprend que la notion de projet architectural devient surtout plus souple et plus fluctuante. C'est la raison pour laquelle il est difficile de commencer toute réflexion architecturale par le projet, qui reste pourtant l'opérateur fondamental de la discipline. J'ai préféré, en quelque sorte par la voie négative, montrer les impasses auxquelles conduisent certains discours qui inclinent à jeter le projet dans les poubelles de l'histoire. Je conclue, le projet architectural est une opération mentale qui permet non seulement de prévoir et d'organiser le chantier, mais aussi d'unifier la conception de l'œuvre. La force incomparable du projet architectural, c'est qu'il sait faire mieux que toute autre pratique artistique ou technique. C'est sa capacité, et je conclurai là-dessus, à dilater le temps et l'espace, Karim en a longuement parlé, à dilater le temps et l'espace par le moyen des architectures pour créer dans les champs d'immanence et de transience des réseaux pour créer des hiatus, des fissures, des îlots, des asiles, des lieux différentiels. Le projet architectural procure à l'homme un véritable pouvoir de débrayage, de changement de régime dans la dispensation du temps et de l'espace. Un pouvoir interstitiel dans les intervalles, et cela au deux sens du terme, en ce sens qu'il ménage des interstices, des intervalles dans le tissu continu des interactions économiques et sociales, mais aussi en tant que ce pouvoir est un pouvoir fragile, toujours à la limite de l'ineffectivité, un pouvoir de débrayage et non pas d'intensification et de mobilisation. Pour nous défendre de l'aliénation que nous fait subir le système productif et nous protéger de la mobilisation totale, il faut cultiver notre sens du temps et de l'espace. Je ne sais par exemple comment il est possible de parler en français de développement durable, en anglais de sustainable development, en l'absence de tout sens de la durée. C'est ça le grand paradoxe de, de, de ces questions-là, ces questions c'est qu'on parle beaucoup de développement durable dans le système productif, mais qu'il n'y a jamais aucune théorie du temps qui vient accompagner cette, euh, cette réflexion. Et je, je fais la même remarque avec le l'expression anglo-saxonne de « sustainable development ». On parle beaucoup de développement, mais il n'y a aucune théorie de la tenue, du maintien, et c'est pourtant dans la tradition philosophique une notion considérable, dans le platonisme, dans le néoplatonisme, dans le stoïcisme, et ces termes sont extrêmement présents, et bien dans la réflexion sur le « sustainable development », on ne dit rien sur ce qu'est la tenue, sur ce qu'est le maintien, sur ce qu'est le soutien, aucune réflexion. Et c'est pareil pour le développement durable, aucune réflexion sur ce qu'est la durée. Eh bien, l'architecture, l'architecture nous permet de réfléchir à ces questions de tenue et de durée. Et la première chose à faire pour garantir au développement économique la durée, c'est d'abord de conquérir ou de reconquérir le sens du temps qui passe aussi par une reconquête du sens de l'espace et du territoire. Il s'agit, ce sont mes derniers mots, il s'agit non pas de réduire les distances ou de cultiver l'instantanéité, comme les propos des nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication, mais de dilater l'espace et le temps. Je dirais même que plus on se donne de moyens techniques pour réduire les distances et les délais, et plus il est important de ménager de l'espace, de la présence et de la durée. La dilatation du temps et de l'espace ne consiste pas à rallonger ce qui a été raccourci, ni à freiner ce qui a été accéléré. Il ne s'agit pas de revenir au temps des diligences. Il s'agit à partir de cette accélération et de cette réduction de créer une intensité dans notre rapport au temps et à l'espace, une intensité que le processus de réduction de l'espace et d'accélération du temps ne permet pas de procurer. Bref, le projet architectural est à mon sens bien plus que les nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication que l'intelligence artificielle et le savoir nous porte le savoir et les techniques mentales fondamentales pour véritablement modifier en profondeur notre système productif 
afin de surmonter son entropie et sa puissance de destruction. Merci de votre attention. Merci de m'avoir permis de, de m'exprimer en français. Mais il est vrai que la langue bon, a aussi euh, son importance. So maybe we can uh, end up the first part of this uh, discussion just uh, for being on time for the second. Because otherwise, of course, we could open the discussion and we would have uh, a lot of questions. But we need to stop to think about it and we go back here. When? What is the time for those who are doing this? Uh, there is one mezza. Half past two, we will start again with uh, good fighting. I would say. <laughs> in a good discussion. Thank you very much.